give yourself pause and permission to reconnect with your childlike curiosity and courage. Leaders have to start building cultures that are built around curiosity and courage, the real foundational pieces to play, which is at the end of the day, having a beginner's mindset. We, we don't grow into creativity, we actually grow out of it. To reconnect with play is to experiment, you know, it's to see what if, it's to have the courage to at least try an idea out. We have to tap back into what it was to be a kid. The best creative collaborations I have witnessed is where people hold a lot of space, they ask more questions, they give answers, and they're understanding the emotional journey. I think really being paying attention to the leader you are, how are you making an environment for your group to feel safe, to tell you, I don't agree with you? Are you giving smart, intelligent people enough autonomy and space to do things? So if we're gonna create psychological safety, it's really important for leaders to start focusing on their own mental health. Your health is more important than your company. When empathy and creativity combine, that is where design thrives. Our courage and curiosity are the foundations to creativity, to collaboration, to critical thinking, and to communication. I started at a very young age with a deep love for art, uh, design, creativity, storytelling, and education. Um, and that led me to uh, going to art and design school. I eventually uh, became a designer at Disney. I spent 15 years there. The first half was in uh, theme park development. And then the second half of that time is when I realized there was something quite not working between the quote unquote creatives and non-creatives. And I became a global creativity and innovation director, both skilling people up in design thinking, uh, in empathy, in creative behaviors, then also leading design sprints uh, for the Disney company across the globe and everything from the studios to, you know, television to theme parks to consumer products, you name it. And then after that, um, I eventually started a, a, a company called Imaginology and we're a creative collaboration uh, agency. So we really uh, help you know train people up in this and then also invent with them so we can overcome the fears and the obstacles to really creating amazing uh, art and creativity experiences, uh, et cetera. So uh, what I stand for above all else, uh, courageous curiosity. I spark that. Uh, I believe in it. I think it's vital for personal growth and really for the future of humanity. What we're noticing is that there is a evolution of collaboration and leadership um, that is really bringing out uh, concerns about how we show up at work. You know, with the pandemic hit, we started having this conversation of what is work-life balance, and we all realized there's really only one life. Um, and we're starting to rethink what is the workplace, let alone entire industries and markets are changing at such an exponential rate, right? Um, just look at chat, GPT, and AI, right? And look what's happening in the entertainment industry with streaming. You know, um, think about the medical industry. Everything's coming so fast. While that's coming quickly, the need for creative collaborations is important, but there's some problems holding that back, right? Cross-functional collaboration is going to be vital. So a lot of corporations, institutions, uh, are siloed creative based on discipline or maybe the market that they're focused on. And part of the problem with that is then there's a lot of pass the baton. Um, there's a lot of inefficient meetings where people are coming together. I think Atlassian did a study that found there's almost 75% of people in corporations found their meetings to be a waste of time and even a higher percent in other work during those meetings. So that's one aspect of that. But then there's also creative siloing you know, the creatives and non-creatives. So that's a creative team and this is a non-creative team. So maybe the designers, the artists, the engineers are over on one side, but the people are doing procurement and business development, um, maybe finance, maybe strategy are, are treated as separate. And look, there's definitely different mindsets there, but by taking creativity and saying it's ownable by only one group, we're actually destroying what the word stands for. And uh, Teresa Mobley does a lot of research out of Harvard I think for 40 years at Harvard and Stanford, uh, and boiling that down from her research and others, we've really identified, you know, creativity is coming up with novel solutions that are useful. And that usefulness is however you define it and the valuableness of that. And so would you not want everybody coming together to create a problem solve, to find novel and useful solutions to things? So getting rid of those creative silos is important, but then from a leadership standpoint, we also have to recognize that there's a lot of fear and that is a human 
thing, right? Um, if anybody's familiar with the hero's journey, um, we reject the call to adventure. You, know, you think about Harry Potter when he's told he's a wizard. He's like, not me. I'm just Harry, right? Um, you can look at any hero or heroine. There's always a rejection of that call to adventure. Um, the first time maybe you got a new job, maybe you felt imposter syndrome or you became a leader. Same area. We've got those blockages. So as we try things that are new, we're inherently trying something that might have fear. And we have to recognize that fear is allowed to be present. Um, I think it's Brene Brown who says fear can sit in the uh, back seat, but it can't drive the car on the road trip and it can't, you know, be a pat, uh, you know, shit sitting shotgun. So I think leaders have to really overcome these things. And it's going to be vital to rethink how we define creativity and how we do cross-functional collaboration. In any collaboration, if we're going to overcome fear, if we're going to get rid of the creative silos, if we're going to kind of remove that um, conflict that's taking up so much time. Um, what's important is to really tap back into our childhood play. Um, I think National Ge Geographic just released something how they talked about for the evolution of humanity plays vital, and I'm right there with it. We have to tap back into what it was to be a kid. And what we have to recognize is, you know, NASA had done a study uh, quite a while ago where they were trying to understand how they could hire more, you know, creative geniuses, people that could problem solve. And they did a study with these, this large group of kids around like five years old, and they found that they registered up to about a 98% of them as a creative genius, able to problem solve uh, efficiently with new and useful ideas, right? Experiment, try things. What they found is that we, we don't grow into creativity, we actually grow out of it. So as they went from that, and five years later, it went down to something like 70%, and then you know, five years later, it was down to like 20 and they were so disheartened, they eventually gave up on the study. Well, the founder of the study went back and met up with these, these kids, now full grown adults. They'd gone through the educational system and the institution of corporations or with jobs. They found that it was something like less than 3% of them were identified as being creative. So what's important here is for us to reconnect with play and to reconnect with play is to experiment, you know, it's to see what if, it's to have the courage to at least try an idea out. And the curiosity, once you've entered that arena, to ask questions, to try, to experiment, to learn from that. And I, we get so hung up on getting it right when it's on a piece of paper, when it's spoken, no one knows if something's gonna work out until we try it. So I really believe leaders have to start building cultures that are built around curiosity, and encourage the real foundational pieces to play, which is at the end of the day, having a beginner's mindset. In my experience, when I was at Disney and outside of Disney, having worked with you know, uh, Oscar winning animators and directors, having worked with people that are engineers, um, physicians, surgeons across the globe, something that's really important is a common language. And so I first want to just kind of give a little framework, you know, art is self-expression, you know, uh, the best case scenario, it's understand yourself so you can share it with the world. And that is very personal. So is the definition of creativity. We ask people, what is that? And galvanizing what we've heard from people, but also the research we've looked at, we define it as the habit of coming up with new and useful or valuable ideas. So when we get over to innovation, right, if we're going to be working together, we have to have a common definition of creativity and innovation. So if creativity is the habit of doing things that are new and useful. Innovation is very similar. A very simple way to measure this is novel solutions um, that are useful for someone you're in service of that create a return on investment for the maker. So think new, useful, return. What's really important to me there is that that return is not always financial. I think sometimes companies so focused on Q1, 2, 3, and 4, you know, are losing the sight of what it means to be purpose-driven. And so that return could be that we get raving fans that care so much about us that they just want to participate in whatever we make, right? Like Walt Disney didn't sit there and say, how can I make money off of people? He had to make a business so he could fund the artists and the people making that, but keep the cost low. So the ROI return on investment, I like to call it return on imagination, right? It's saying like, what are we getting for what we're doing here that can help us keep this going? And that is not just fiscal. Again, focusing on money, that is something you do as an output. If you look at the music industry, somebody doesn't say, how am I going to make music that's going to make money? They focus on that. However, if you look at the Beatles, John Lennon talked about in the early days, they're doing a new kind of sound. 
but they recognized that they wanted to be able to fund their more artistic pro projects. They're more artistic for them. So they went after kind of an audience they knew loved the kind of music they were making, which was young girls. So they sang about sweetheart songs, right? That was their their kind of return is people, they're saying, make it useful for this younger female audience. And they're saying, hey, we can get some return on this because they're going to spread the news and they're going to love this music. So I think sometimes we demonize the idea. It's interesting and weird when like, when you're creating art inside of a business, it can feel like this, like, yeah, but this is what my art says. But you have to recognize that if you're making it for an audience, there's a full spectrum of how you do it. Sometimes you're just doing it from the artist's soul and you put it out there and you hope people will go for it. But sometimes you can also sit there and understand your audience and maybe what they're feeling or thinking or how they're behaving. And that's a really interesting way to rethink what a uh, return means for a company. From what I've seen out there from my personal experience, you know, I've seen people that work on everything from TV shows to creating uh, amazing theme park attractions, you know, like I said, Oscar winners, you name it, people creating amazing work, but at the cost of what, you know, like just because you're putting amazing things out, what is, how are you doing it in your personal state? You know, what's your mental health, your emotional health, your physical health, and for some people, spiritual health, however you define that, maybe just like how you're feeling connected to a bigger picture. So within that, you know, empathy is so important. And so is mindfulness on that being mindful of your state. You know, sometimes people get caught up in kind of this addiction to work and just, you know, kind of saying, well, I'm inside a company and I have to stay late. I've got to do extra hours. I have to work weekends. Not true. Your health is more important than your company. And there's plenty of data and research that shows the more you take care of yourself, the better you perform at work. You know, um, we can only actually work in something like two to three hour sprints. And this is why we organically need to get up and take breaks. So being aware of your state and being mindful, that's one aspect of it. Another part of mindfulness is just being aware of your own thoughts. You know, we're so quick to sometimes knee jerk react to things because of things like fear or worry, you know, underneath it for many executives, when they're taking a big swing on something, they're worried about their career, they're worried about their family, their mortgage, putting their kids through college, and that's underpinning whether they realize it or not. So being mindful of your kind of decisions and thought patterns is a big aspect of understanding self and other, and that bridge to other is part of empathy. So sometimes we've heard, you know, empathy being like walk in someone else's shoes. I want to kind of push that to the side and really say it's more about seeking to understand how someone feels about something and believing in how they feel about it, whether or not you can relate to that. It's not about relating and saying, oh, I felt that too. It's, you know, I'll give you a quick example. I was in the airport and I was coming back from an international trip working in London. And as I came back to New York, I was walking into the restroom and I heard what I sounded like, you know, someone screaming bloody murder in a big argument. Um, I took a step back. I see like a captain from one of the planes about to walk in. He turns around and leaves. And there's a custodial person screaming uh, at some, you know, person that was inside the, the airport. And I remembered this empathy kind of training that I had gotten. And I just paused. And while he's yelling, I said, whoa, whoa, whoa hey, 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 he's like, he goes, we don't understand. He threw it. And he's like yelling. He goes, all I said was, I can see that you're upset and you have every right to be. He instantly calmed down. I watched his body drop. My friend that was with me, my colleague was just like, what was that magic? I'm like, it was the first time I ever tried it. I just like clicked into it. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, when someone's disagreeing on an idea and they're getting frustrated or they're getting angry, or you recognize what's going on there, you can ask like, so how are you feeling about this? And if they say, I don't feel like this is going to work, instead of jumping over the top of them and saying, here's why it's going to work, maybe just start to understand, be curious, be courageous to hold space for them and listen and understand. The best creative collaborations I have witnessed is where people hold a lot of space, they ask more questions, they give answers, and they're understanding the emotional journey. Because I can tell you right now, of every big idea I've ever sold in with people, it really is related to how people feel about the insight or the idea or the experience, it's not the rational thinking about it. So we have to start having more empathy for people's experiences in the workplace. When I was at Disney, I was watching ideas not work out. It was actually, we were in a big brainstorm with Pixar, animation studios and the theme parks, and there was like 40 people in the room. 
and everybody's yelling up at a, a flip chart. And I remember sitting there going like, the people are more introverted thinkers. They think internally and need to take time. We're not saying anything. The extroverted thinkers, they're just like dominating the meeting. And I knew something wasn't working out. So as I started to try to understand, well, what does it mean to come together? There's some key simple things we can start doing starting tomorrow if you're in a corporation. First thing is, every time you get together with people, in any kind of gathering, whether it's one-on-one -on -one or a small group or a large group, start every meeting with what is the purpose of this meeting, what's the process of it, and what's the outcome we want to get, right? So it's the purpose, the process, and the outcome, the PPP. Why are we here? How are we going to spend our time? And what are we going to walk out with? That's a great way to kind of get everybody on the same page before you start so meetings don't meander. But now once people start coming together and sometimes that conflict or misalignment happens, one thing that we have found that works incredibly well is to separate out the time when we're expansive with our thinking and we're reductive with our thinking, right? So if you think about expansive, reductive thinking, um, kids are great at this. Expansive thinking, curious, asking questions, anything's possible. There's no rules. Reductive thinking, analyzing, making decisions, uh, judgment, uh, refinement, you know, choices, thinking strategically those go together like oil and water. And often when we try to do those on top of each other in a conversation, we're increasing cortisol. That is why we feel so tired in meetings. Whereas, you know, I was working with the CFO of Hyperloop Transportation. We put him in two back-to-back -back days, 16-hour workshop. And at the end, he goes, wow. He's like, after just a half day of meetings, as we did before, I felt like I've run a marathon. I'm wiped out. I'm burnt out. His cortisol is draining him. That is our stress hormone. He goes, after two days with you, I feel like I can run a marathon. You know, uh, Timo, a guy from uh, Europe that works for uh, Warner Brothers, you know, I, he came, he said he came into our, our workshops feeling like he was um, 55 and he leaves here feeling 35. Why is that? Because we separate expansive or inductive thinking and let people know, hey, we're going to be in this space now and then this space, anything goes, or we're going to be really reductive by chunking that out. It creates a space where you're actually creating more trust. People know where to be curious and where to say, now we're going to really be poking holes on idea or here we're going to be building it. We're able to treat ideas, thoughts, suggestions like a plant, a little seedling that somebody's planted and nurture it, not to green light it, but to know like, what do we have here? And let's create many of those things to understand better. So we're creating you know, happiness chemicals, serotonin and oxytocin, they're building trust. Those are the trust happy chemicals. They last longer, right? So again, try to set up a purpose process payoff and really separate out some time to say when we're going to be talking expansively and building like a champion of anything anybody shares and landing those, but then also separating time to be reductive and poke holes so people know which behavior you're asking for. I think it's important for people to pay attention to their company's purpose and values and really do some soul searching because if they're not aligned with themselves, you're going to be lying to your soul as a creator, as a maker, as a business person, we're all creative, right? And creativity is on a spectrum of, you know, down here to like high powered creatives. But when we go in, we want to make and do things. We have to really start listening to ourselves. Steven Spielberg talks about what we're meant to do in life is kind of like a whisper and you can have small whispers of things you're meant to do, you know, and maybe where you're feeling misalignment. Um, Lauren DeVillier works with me. She worked with me at Disney and she talks about how sometimes if you have to pay attention, if you're rubbing up against your values, you know, for our group at Imaginology, it spent, took a lot of time for me to really uncover those values. I'm like, do I value design? Do I value this? And at the end of the day, what would boil down to is the big purpose is to spark courageous curiosity right? And reconnect people to play. But underneath that, our values are two things, experimentation and people first, people over profit. So we're always holding ourselves accountable to those and check like, what are those values in your company and see if they're aligned with you. And sometimes that takes the courage to leave and go find a different job or maybe a different leader in your organization you want to work with that has values more aligned with you. And I think that's one aspect of this that is often overlooked we're starting to have these awakenings after the pandemic of like, what am I going to do with my life? Where am I going to put my energy and time? And then when it comes to thriving in that environment and you have that, now we want to make sure we're in a safe environment we can take risk, right? Because if we're going to experiment, we need to be able to flop. Pixar used to talk about how they have a, um, their leadership sets up essentially a 
a net, world's largest net with the world's, world's largest pillows underneath it, right? So that you can take free falls of risk to try things and take big swings. So I think really being paying attention to the leader you are, how are you making an environment for your group to feel safe, to tell you, I don't agree with you, uh, to share things? And also, if you're a leader, are you giving smart, intelligent people enough autonomy and space to do things? I'm really passionate about this. Hire people that are smarter than you or have potential to be greater than what you do and protect the values and empower them with the purpose. Let them go off and do things on their own. Have them bring back minimum viable ideas, concepts, things, you know, show it early, show it often. But remember, like to empower them, you've got to let them fail to learn it. It's like, can you imagine trying to learn a bike by reading about it and somebody holding it all the time? You know, you have to fall down to get back up. And I really believe that collectively, if we support each other as a team and as leadership to drop balls and pick them up together to move forward, it's going to be far better than worrying, what if I drop the next ball? And then people won't take those risks or worrying like, what if I say, I don't have the energy to work Friday, but I'm happy to work, you know, on Monday a little bit more. I just need to take Friday off. We have to let people try these things out and work with the individual and the collective to really help that you know, creativity, collaboration, and critical thinking thrive. Previous generations were used to being yelled at by their bosses, being um, almost like, you know, married to the job and prioritizing that over their health and their personal life. So if we're going to create psychological safety, it's really important for leaders to start focusing on their own mental health, their own psychological understanding of how they're showing up. And that goes back to childhood, you know, I'm proud to say I've gone through therapy for myself to understand what's my relationship to conflict? You know, what's my relationship um, uh, to expressing myself? What's my relationship to work? What's my relationship to achievement? And in doing that work, it only makes me a better leader. And so when I talk about courageous curiosity, that's not only in creating things, that's courageous curiosity to go internal and to look inside yourself and understand yourself more so that you can be a better father, uh, a better husband, a better partner, a better collaborator, a better leader, a better coworker, whatever it is, you know, a better human being. And I think, you know, I'm a big fan of Ted Lasso. If you haven't watched that, that's a great 101 to kind of see this in action. Um, we're on the precipice of a grand awakening around empathy. And when empathy and creativity combine, that is where design thrives, creating things that are useful and not just useful for the end user, creating things that take in consideration the creator, the maker. We've got to start focusing as much on who we make things for in design and creativity as much as we focus on the people creating them. And that's a, a, a really big passion point of mine. Life is made of strength and struggle. Life is made of joy and suffering. And if we are going to come together, we have to recognize that this is going to be messy. It's going to be hard, but if we all stay curious and we all stay courageous together, let's drop balls, pick them up and move forward together and admit that fear will be here and share those fears because if we can get those out on the table and talk about them, we can move through things and do extraordinary stuff together. I think when it comes to mental health, self-discovery of our emotions and our upbringing, you know, when we're children, we're a blank slate that our parents are writing on. The way we handle that conflict, the way we handle communication, the way we handle risk. Age helps a lot. You hear about people in their 70s to 90s letting go more. You know, so when I talk about creativity and courage, I talk a lot about having a beginner's mindset, not being married to outcomes. And that's about being present. So, you know, age will help you realize these things. But if you even just get into meditation, you know, there's apps like Calm and start practicing the quieting of your mind to be in the moment. That is where play lives, right? That's where creativity lives. Because when you look at some of the best innovators and creators, they look at a hard challenge, not with fear, but within this is going to be hard. I'm excited to see if we can figure it out. And so being mindful, not only to create those things, being mindful about ourselves and what our state is, is going to create that space. So age is going to help, but we can start building um, resiliency. There's something called um, anti-fragility, and it's kind of like resilience 2.0. So if you think about um, dropping a glass and it shatters on the ground, right? 
that's obviously fragile. A plastic cup drops and it bounces and dings around. While it was, uh, you know, not fran- fragile, it's not anti-fragile. What I mean by that is like our muscles are anti-fragile. Imagine if you dropped a, a glass and it cracked, but it grew back stronger. So when our muscles break, when we work out, it's building back stronger. So if we're able to take on um, hard things like understanding ourselves, it's going to be hard. There's no doubt. There might be pain, there might be emotional toil, but as we do that and we're able to handle hard things, we come back stronger. And we've got to, as leaders, work on having difficult conversations. As human beings, we have to learn to have hard, difficult conversations that help us learn more about others, have empathy about their experience, but also have compassion for ourselves and recognize we might be wrong about something or, oh, I never realized I was behaving that way with others. Asking, hey, what's it like to work with me? Give me honest feedback. It's okay. And you don't have to agree with it, but you can understand where they're coming from. So I'm a big fan of, you know, the mindfulness and the meditation piece that can really help with that. Give yourself pause and permission to reconnect with your childlike curiosity and courage. Um, Play can often be misinterpreted as something that's wasting time. It's childish. But really, I want you to be out there experimenting. I want you to be out there taking risks and trying things, even if they're small ones. Those risks could be daring journeys internally about sharing about how you feel about something or standing up and saying, I don't have the energy to take this on right now. Um, I'd like to rethink that. But really tap into your courageous curiosity because that is where your personal growth will create growth with the others you're around. And at the end of the day, our courage and curiosity are the foundations to creativity, to collaboration, to critical thinking, and to communication. And if we can start leaning into creative curiosity, I really believe that it's going to be vital for the, you know, survival of humanity, let alone our own personal relationships in our, you know, personal lives and our personal relationships in our, you know, business lives.